So hello, everyone. My name is James Goff from Heirloom Fire, an open fire catering company located here in the Berkshires. And uh, today we're going to be talking about a Christmas feast, kind of a forgotten Christmas feast, a golden goose. So before we get into that, I want to thank Field and Supply for asking us to partner with them on this dinner presentation. Uh, so behind the camera, since this is a live Instagram feed, behind the camera I have Miss Emily, who will be fielding questions. So if anybody has any questions whatsoever, please feel free to type them in the chat box. Uh, we probably won't get to them, but uh, no, I'm kidding, of course. I, I love questions, so engage as much as you absolutely would like to. And then we have Chad dealing with all of our technical information and making sure that the uh, stream runs the way it should be. So we're running on three cameras today, super high tech here in the Berkshires out in the country. So it's beautiful. It snowed really, really a lot today. And we had probably maybe four or five inches of accumulation. It's beautiful. Totally put me in the Christmas spirit. So goose, goose has this terrible reputation for being greasy. Same thing with duck. The problem is people just don't know how to prepare it. It's very simple. And the, the sort of, uh, you know, the lore behind it and the tradition is that people have been eating goose, especially over in Europe, for thousands of years. It's incredible. So way back, even, you know, in the Grecian times, they used to actually offer geese as an offering to Thor and Odin for a wonderful year's harvest. The problem is when the uh, colonists came over here to the United States, there wasn't a lot of geese around. So that's why we have much more turkeys. So geese are much more prevalent over in Europe. So today, like I said, we're going to talk about preparing our goose. It's very simple and it is so delicious. I'm doing this outside over the fire, but you can easily do this inside of your oven. So uh, in addition to the goose, we're actually going to be doing Yorkshire puddings as well with the goose fat. So we're going full English for this particular holiday feast. So we have here is a goose. It's about maybe five, six pounds or so. Beautiful, massive, massive uh, creature. So first thing you're going to do, if you're, if you're getting it from a farm or if you're getting it from a, a, a grocery store, you know, obviously look for the best quality you can possibly find. First thing you're going to want to do is get into the cavity. Now, as one of my culinary instructors told me in school, you're never a true chef until you serve something with the trussing wire on it, or when you roast something with the innards inside of it still. So what we're gonna do is go inside and see, because sometimes some farms will actually keep them and sell them to restaurants or something like that. Yes, Emily, over in the corner, we have a question perhaps? We have a question from Beth. Uh, Beth. She's wondering, where you recommend sourcing a goose from the Hudson Valley because your local market does not carry goose. Interesting. So I would check with uh, D'Artagnan, which does a lot, or Hudson Valley foie gras is a great place uh, to look into. Uh, there's something called uh, Hudson Valley Harvest, which is on uh, the, the old interweb there. And you can look up goose uh, purveyors. And I think you should be able to find something within that realm. Uh, also, if you happen to know anybody that's a local chicken farm or something like that, they might be turned on to rowing geese. So that's the thing is anyone else that's listening, this is the thing, just like any store, people aren't gonna sell something that does not sell. So if you have enough supply and demand to a poultry farmer, maybe they'll actually want to grow a flock of geese for the following year. So I'm actually going to be uh, engaging with a farm up in uh, upstate New York, which is going to do a test batch of geese for us because I'm hoping to be able to make foie gras from the, uh, from the, from the liver. So uh, Beth, I hope that answers your question out there. So the next thing, so we have our innards here. Do not throw these away. What you want to do is put these aside for now. Inside of here, you'll most likely have a liver, you'll have your gizzards, you'll have your kidneys, and, and here too should be uh, a neck as well. Look at that. Look at that. That is quite fantastic. This is so good. Picture like chicken wings or something like that, braised or slowly cooked. All this meat in here, you got to figure how much they're actually working with their neck, all that beautiful muscle development, the more action a muscle has, the more flavor it's going to have. So it's absolutely fantastic. So save these, put them in a bag, don't throw them out. Now we wanna prep the goose a little bit. I'm gonna take it off of this rest, rest or, excuse me, take this out of this roasting rack. Now it's important to have a roasting rack in this case because the goose has lots of fat on it and that's gonna render down and we're gonna collect all that in the base. So the cool thing also about geese versus ducks is that the fat begins to render around 116 degrees, which is quite low. So ducks usually render around 128 degrees. So 
through the action of friction and even touching the goose fat renders quite a bit. And we're going to take advantage of that as we're going to apply a rub here. Now, also, I want to be able to tell you that uh, through this presentation, there won't be any recipes. I'm going to be talking about what we're using, but go if you head to heirloomfire.com, H-E-I-R-L-O-O-M fire.com and sign up for the mailing list. In a few days, I will be releasing the recipe and the preparations for this. Instagram, so I might have to, have to disconnect the Instagram feed. Oh, all right. Okay, fantastic. But try to fire it back up because it'd be good to somehow be able to get to use it. Well, so anybody that's watching through Instagram, sorry, we're having some technical difficulties as uh, as it would be. The audio is challenging. So anybody that's watching on Instagram, please go to the Field and Supply website, scroll through what's happening. This video is streaming on there live. And it will be uh, saved on their database as well. So thank you, everyone who uh, logged in through Instagram. Please go to fieldandsupply.com. I'm switching over to this camera now. So uh, apologies. So uh, yeah, so we're going to take advantage of that fat rendering as we're going to be putting this rub on here through the friction of our hand and the warmth of our hand around 100 degrees. It's going to help to render some of that fat. And through the scoring process, which is key to cooking any sort of game bird, whether it be a duck or a goose that has a big fat cap. So first thing we're going to do, obviously, we took our innards out. We took a look, make sure there's nothing else in there. Beautiful. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take our wings and we're going to kind of take them. This may feel a little weird to you. It's definitely a bit of a different preparation, but take it. We're going to twist it behind. You see that? It's behind the goose. Don't mind the leaking. We'll clean that up later. So again, wing tip bend back towards its breast, fold it and clip it down. Naturally, it will stay that way. Now this just saves on space inside of your oven and your roasting pan. So the next thing we're gonna do is because this goose is loaded with fat, we are going to begin to score it. So very important, you need to get a sharp knife. So uh, currently I'm using uh, a knife that someone ended up giving to me for feedback and I absolutely love it. It's called Artisan Revere. It uses something called LMAX steel, which is traditionally used in survival knives or hunting knives and things like that. So it's a very, very hard steel, but it's also been uh, worked into using with chef knives. So it holds an edge for a really long time. It's fantastic. Now, important things to note here while we're scoring the goose, we're not gonna look to cut all the way through the fat into the meat. If you see the red of the meat, you've gone too deep. What we're gonna do is we're gonna really just use the weight of the knife. We're gonna score down, score down. And what we're trying to establish here is a nice pattern. We're looking for a crosshatch. This helps the fat render out. We're looking to just break the skin. And since the goose renders at such a lower temperature, it doesn't take much at all. So, yes, ma'am, we have a, a, maybe a question? Yes. Emily, so, over there. Brad is wondering. Brad is wondering. If the goose is gaming. If the goose is gaming. No, absolutely not. The goose is not gaming at all. It's actually one of the most delicious tasting poultry or meats. It's one of my favorites, really, if prepared well. Now, the advantage of cooking this in the wood oven is it's going to pick up a nice smoky flavor. So picture bacon. Almost everybody loves bacon, right? And if you're not a meat eater, you're a vegetarian, there's some product out there. We love smoke. I really think that we evolved as, as a species, as human beings, to really resonate with the flavor of smoke. Now, smoke totally gets into things that are super high in fatty. So bacon is very fatty. Goose is very fatty. Duck is very fatty. So this will help absorb some of that wood smoke. So if you're not cooking it in a wood oven and you have maybe a Weber grill or a smoker at your house and you have the ability to cold smoke your goose or maybe cook it so that's around 120 degrees, rest it in there, bank your coals on one side, put your goose in the other side and try to let it smoke as best you can so it absorbs some of that beautiful, beautiful fat. And if you have the opportunity to age your goose a little bit, it's going to be even better. Same thing with, uh, with ducks. Ducks, they're really, the reason why geese and ducks, their, their flesh is red as opposed to say a chicken is they're basically like Olympic athletes. They have a lot more blood in their system because they're very, very active. So that's what's happening uh, with those things. But it's not gamey whatsoever. I think it gets a bit of a bum rap because of people not knowing how to cook it. Traditionally with a chicken, there's really not much fat at all. So you want to sear it and get a nice crispy skin on it. And with a duck or a goose, I mean, I used to go out to restaurants and specifically order uh, a duck just to see if they knew what they were doing. Because if you put a duck into a smoking hot pan or a goose into a smoking hot pan, they're going to seal in the fat. 
and the fat becomes like a rubber band. You need to render it out and cook it really slowly. Yes, Emily. Yes. So Faith, hello, Faith. You're wondering if there's a flavor of specific wood chips or wood that I would use. I'm a big fan of oak and cherry and apple is really great. Mesquite, if you want to get into that, that's a really, really heavy smoke. Um, for us, if you guys, if you, if you have your notepads handy, really one of the best things is something called Japanese knotweed. Now, Japanese knotweed is an invasive species. It was uh, brought in here as an ornamental. It's a relative of bamboo, but it's also related to buckwheat as well as rhubarb. Now, this time of year, it's all dried out. So we take those standing dry stalks and use them to smoke over. So it gives us almost amazing blackberry smoke flavor quality to whatever we're cooking. And also gives an opportunity to beat back some of that invasive species. Uh, if you want to learn more about invasive species, a big part of our cooking, if you follow us, you'll see we post quite a bit about that. So we're scoring all the way down now, particularly in the groin type of area, there's a, a good thick amount of fat. So you can be a little bit more uh, intense about how deep you want to go here. So, so far, you know, I've gone one way completely with the duck and I can already feel the fat, I'm sorry, with the goose, I can already feel the fat rendering on my fingers. I switched direction, twisted just like this and began the cross hatch there. Now be around, there's, there's a sternum right there. Not a big deal, just don't go too deep into that. So now we've scored the front. Again, in the groin area, there's a lot of big fat flaps. You can choose to cut these off or you can choose to leave them on there because they're a delicious crispy treat. I mean, I mean this, this is what it's about. That's sort of like a chef's cut. And also another really great chef's cut is the neck skin back here. You'll see that. You can cut that off or you can keep it, but it's beautiful. That's just gonna be for you as you're prepping this goose up because it's really fantastic. So now you've gotten into that, you scored the front, you scored the thighs. We're gonna flip it over real quick. And again, kind of in this love handle area, which maybe some of us have also adapted and sort of uh, made a part of our life with this COVID situation. A little fat in here too. This goose definitely has been sitting down watching a lot of Netflixing, maybe not chilling as much, but it's been definitely enjoying itself eating some pretty rich food. So we're getting in there, scoring under the crosshatch. Now take your time with the scoring and the crosshatching too, because that will be a part of the presentation. So now that we've scored that, we've looked at it, we're happy. If you want to cut some of this off, the fat, same thing with ducks too. You can put that into a pan and roast that in an oven, strain it and collect it. It's absolutely golden. Yes, Emily. Hundred. So, okay. Uh, so Beth is wondering if I would ever recommend a goose cone feed, 100%. And that's the beauty about this animal too. You're using the fat that's coming out of it. You're using and reserving the thighs and the drumsticks, which inherently are going to be a little bit tougher. That's great. Absolutely. You can hold on to the fat and get many, many uses out of this. Wings and wing tips. You can nibble on the wings as a beautiful meal yourself. Hold on to those. Any bones on here that you take, including the sternum, the ribs, all that stuff, make a stock out of it as well. So, all right. So now we've scored our duck. Now in our rub here, a few things. We have Japanese, I'm sorry, Chinese five spice, thyme, fresh garlic, lemon zest, and we're going to season with salt. The most important thing inside that five spice that we're going to be isolating is something called star anise. It has this aroma compound in it, which for whatever reason makes meat taste more meaty. So that's, and also I love the addition of that spice. So first thing we're going to do is we got our sea salt on here. Really season it liberally because this is a big goose. Now, in addition to seasoning just the skin, we want to make sure to get inside the cavity as well because that steaming will come through and it's just going to help our goose taste more delicious. So make sure you get that in there, right? Right, boom, boom, just like that. And the same thing with the back. Don't, don't be shy with the back because right above the thighs here is you have something called the oyster. It's this luscious dark meat. Again, from them moving around and waddling like this, they develop this beautiful uh, waistline and it's absolutely delicious. Again, it's a bit of a chef's treat because there's only two of them on the bird. So now we've done that, wipe our hands down, roll in with cherry. I'm using a tamut cherry here. I think that's the way to pronounce it. If not, please somebody correct me in the comments. But uh, I kind of got introduced to this because the regular tele cherry was out of stock at the grocery store due to COVID. And this is really interesting. It almost has this Szechuan quality to it. It's a bit zingy. It's a bit citrusy. It's really funky and really interesting. If you haven't tried it, I highly recommend that you give it a swing. Really nice. Hmm? 
Pella cherry is the name of the variety. So, sorry, we're uh, talking behind the camera here about the name of the uh, the name of the cherry, the variety. Okay, so now we've seasoned it. Now we got our little mix here. Again, for those of you just tuning in, this recipe will be available on the email list through heirloomfire.com. Get on there. We post a lot of different stuff. We have podcasts going dig, you know, digging deep into food and sustainability. So now what we're going to do, as I said, we're going to coat this really well, right? And now you made those score marks. We're going to rub it in. You want to get it into those score marks now through the friction, through the friction and also the natural grittiness of everything that's inside of that five spice. It's sort of being uh, sort of exfoliating the goose. Now, I don't know if you can see that through this camera, but you can really see those cross hatches standing out. It's really beautiful. We want to get that flavor deep in there. So again, the thighs, again, a little inside. We don't want to, you know, this is this is Christmas time, right? You got your most loved people around here. You're going to be working. You want to produce a beautiful meal. So don't be shy here. We want the food to actually have flavor. All right. So on the back, right, all the way through, rub it in back here. Rub it into those love handles. Rub them, rub them. Help this poor goose, you know. He's got all this weight we need to sweat out. All right, beautiful. Okay, so now we have it seasoned up. So as you've been cooking, we also have lemons from lemon zest. See this lemon here, all the zest is off. Okay, no waste ever here. As much as you can reuse and give things different life, more life. So we're gonna cut this in half and we're gonna stuff this inside. Why do you stuff anything inside of a bird? Stuffing, bread, you know, bread-based stuffing or anything else you might pay? Well, it helps insulate the inside of the bird so it cooks evenly. Those are our two lemons that we used. Garlic, we're gonna go ahead and take a whole head of garlic, cut it in half, put that inside of the bird as well. Paper and all, yeah, we're not wasting. The paper does, and even if you have garlic paper at your house, a big fan of collecting that paper, putting in a bag in the freezer and reusing it when it comes to stock. Everything, almost everything has flavor. Thyme, now thyme was used in here. You're not gonna use all the thyme. If you're gonna take this extra thyme, you can have rosemary, sage, if you have a garden, anything you have growing in there, Miss Frost is coming in the snow. Now it's time to harvest and use it. We take it. We're gonna pack it inside of this goose. Real nice, like. Thyme is probably my favorite herb. It has all these beautiful volatile oils inside of it that are so aromatic. All right. So now we're now. You may you know with other poultry that you'd be using, you would traditionally truss the item so it's very compact so it cooks evenly. Because a goose is so big, we're actually going to not truss it because we want the thighs and the drumsticks to be cooked along the same time as these big, beautiful breasts. So uh, we're not gonna trust it. We're gonna let it do its thing like this. We're gonna put it into a resting rack, elevated above of, uh, you know, where it's gonna be cooking with some vessel to be able to collect all that fat. So now the first thing we're gonna do with this is we're gonna put it into a relatively high oven heat, right around about 450 degrees we're going to cook that for about 10 or 15 minutes. What that's going to do is it's going to help establish a bit of a crispy, crispy skin. And then we're going to lower the temperature down to about 375 degrees, which will then help cook it. And that's going to cook for about maybe an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. So again, recipe will be on the website through an email blast. All right. So now we have the goose prepped, ready to roll. Now, in preparation, if you're doing a big Christmas feast for your small gatherings this year, you can rub this down and let this hang out in the refrigerator overnight. That's it. You don't want to put out too much on your plate. It's too much sometimes. So it's all about staging and preparation. So now we're going to take our goose and we're going to move it over to our fire. Now, Mr. Chad, if you'd be so kind as to adjust our camera. And if uh, I can't quite tell, but if Chad's rocking it, you should be able to see my beautiful face right now. Hello. So what we're doing is we're going to slide this into our wood-fired oven. Let this cook. And then, because, uh, you know, the Berkshires is a bit of a magical place. A lot of alchemy happens here. Through the power of time, preparation, and magic, voila, what would take normally an hour and 15 minutes has only taken moments. So now we're going to walk back over to here. Those beautiful roasted goose. So as you may see, look at the color. It looks a lot smaller. There's a lot of fat down in here. Beautiful. So. What we're going to do after we've roasted this goose, we're going to take it. It's very important that when you're at your house, it's cooking outside. I'm going to want to cover this with aluminum foil or something like that to keep the protein warm. But if you're cooking in the house, get the heat on, get the wood stove going. 
You're going to set that aside. You'll need to be covering it for about 15 to 20 minutes. While that's happening, you would have made your batter for your Yorkshire puddings ahead of time. Now, the beauty about this is you can do this entire batter in a blender and let it sit overnight. Now, the reason you need to let it rest is because in the batter, you have eggs, you have milk, you have salt, you have flour. So as you're whipping all of that together, what ends up happening is uh, you're developing gluten in the pan. And uh, I'm sorry, in, in the batter. And by letting it rest for at least 30 minutes or overnight, it relaxes. We want a really, really succulent soft dough. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our goose out like so and let it rest there. And then we have all this beautiful fat. I, bet, I think we have probably around, I would say, at least a cup, a cup and a half of fat. So meanwhile, while this is all cooking, while that's resting, Chad, you can switch camera, please. So over here by the fire, I have, actually, I got to go back over and uh, get a towel. Ch Chad, if we can go back to main camera just one second. All right, Chad, I bet you didn't think it was going to be this much work, but <laughs> it happens with us. So I got it. Very important, get your towels. We've preheated. Now, if you're doing this at home, Chad, if you can go back to the camera of the fire, please. So if you're doing this at home, you got a muffin tin or they sell Yorkshire puddings or popover tins. You want to crank your heat up. So we reduce the fire down to 350 degrees or your oven down to 350 degrees. Slid in your muffin tin, pop over tin. Let that rock in there for probably 10, 10, 15 minutes. It's really hot, right? So 10 minutes, then you're going to pull it out. And this is going to happen really quick. So you got to have all your mise en place, as the chefs say, all, everything all in one place. You have it all ready to go. So we got the dough or we got the batter in a pitcher that we're going to use from our friends at Magnolia Home. We're going to use... That, take this off the heat, we're immediately going to pour it in. So what happens is we're going to use some of that goose fat. We're going to put that inside of this tin, and then we're going to pour our batter in. So it's going to happen. Boom, boom, boom. So you can put your fat in first, get that hot. Also, alternatively, so you're not insane like me, and then pour your batter in. You want to hear a sizzle. And you're going to throw that inside of your oven untouched for about 15 to 20 minutes. I like 20 minutes. You want it to get nice and puffy because then it's going to collapse. So here we go, right? Taking it off the fire, bringing it over. Chad, if we can switch back to the main camera, please. All right, here we go. A little ashy. I'm into that. That's okay. That's we're cooking over the fire. So obviously, you know, we all don't have steel hands like me. That's okay. So we're going to go with about six here. So I'm feeling a little gluttonous tonight. So we'll put about uh, one tablespoon or actually one teaspoon in. Right now we're going to roll with our batter. It's almost like pancake batter right into this pitcher. It's kind of cold out here. So it's a little gloopy before, you know, you, the consistency really is like uh, crepe batter, like loose pancake batter. So we're going to fill it about our muffin tins about three quarters of the way. And then because of the eggs in here for my chickens, it's going to have a bit of a souffle quality. So when you put it into your oven, Chad, if we can go to second camera, please. Put it into our oven. And then if most of you are, you know, folks that are more up with the times, if you have a regular oven, you're going to shut it. And you're not going to touch it. Because if you're peeking, if you're peeking, it's going to happen. It's going to screw up with the airflow and they could collapse. This is magic. This is alchemy. So please enjoy. And then, boom, through the magic of time and preparation, boom, this is what they look like. Unbelievable. So, so hot. The pan is cold. Unreal. All right. So now what we're going to do, set a pan aside. If you have fat left over, do not waste it. Put it in a container. Put it in a refrigerator. Use this like butter. This is gold. It'll make everything taste 10 times better. It's going to change your life. So we're going to set this back here for now on the stone wall. We're going to pop our, so after you've cooked your popovers, your Yorkshire puddings, whatever you want to call them, Want to let them rest, and you'll see they'll start to cave in on the top. Beautiful for gravy if you're going to make a sauce also from these bones or you have leftover. So it's gorgeous. Mm. It's kind of a similar dough as with like profiteroles we made from it. It's almost like uh, kind of eggy and custardy, almost like eclair dough. So then we'll pop those out like so. A beautiful goose fat has lined it up so that we don't have to waste uh, anything, waste time with popping them out. All right, so now we got our goose. Right, lift it out. Beautiful. It's been resting. Seems strange, but smoked lemons, really, really nice. So we're gonna get into the thigh here. Cut in, cut in. That's the first thing we're gonna do. 
now to make you feel good if you don't do this often. Once you've broken into the thighs, come down, and then you'll just give them a little pop like that. And what will happen is the hip bone will disconnect from the bird. Oh, my God. And if I could tell you guys, the way this smells, it's un unreal. It to be a savage, but you got to get into these drumsticks. That's amazing. If anybody has been to Disneyland and eaten those big turkey legs, it's better than that. So we got that happening. We got the legs. Really great. Pop this. Mm. Easy. Boom, boom. Obviously, you have a nice serving platter. All the sternum. The sternum is really popped out here. Follow that. Use it as a guide with your knife. Down through. Same thing up here in the collarbone or the wishbone area. And then peel it back as you're carving. It's very simple. It basically tells you how it wants to be cut. Boom. Right? One breast down. Same thing with the next one. In. Boom. Rotate. Down through. Ride the rib cage. There you go. Turn to the knife. Boom. Same thing with the wings. They're just similar to the thighs as well. You're going to twist till you feel the pop. Find out where that joint disconnects. Get your knife in between. Boom. Off. Same thing. Pull it back. Boom. You feel it. It just sings to you. Tells you exactly how it wants to be cut. So now... We have all the rest of this meat that's just for good pickings. But like I said earlier, <clears throat> look at this. It looks small. But it's one of these types of things that you get so much bang for the buck. This is the neck skin. So crispy. I don't know if you can hear that through the microphone. It's amazing. Very good. Smoky. Delicious. Set your carcass aside. You break this up into smaller pieces so it fits into your stock pot. It'll cook quicker. Also, a really great tip. I highly recommend it. The other thing where man, I'm like struggling between enjoying that neck skin and being able to talk to you guys. I mean, I need like a 10 minute break here because it's so good. But with when you're making stock, it has this whole thing where you got to labor over the stove and ladle off the fat and then it cook for six hours in the stove top. It's just not true. Now, there's a common thing everybody might have in their house because it was super trendy for a little bit. An instant pot. If you use that, some pressure, or if you have a pressure cooker to make a stock in there, throw your bones, throw your vegetables, throw your leftover herbs, you have an amazing stock in one hour that's the same quality of a stock that you've cooked for six hours. So I highly recommend going in and using that as a, with, as a great way to use stock. And also, if you have just chickens, like chickens here and there, I think you need a minimum of like three chickens or maybe a goose and a chicken to make a really great stock. You can reduce that down, put them into cooler containers, freeze them. Fantastic. It's almost like a stock concentrate. So, guys, I think that almost concludes where we are. Could you end up thinly slicing your goose breast? Not too thin, because the thinner you slice it, the quicker the heat will escape. So, a good slice like that, maybe an inch, half inch thick. You'll shingle that out onto a platter, along with your thighs and drumsticks. Same situation here. You're going to find naturally where the bird. Uh, is bending again same deal twist back you'll feel the joint separate now you have your drumstick you have your thigh so you can serve it as it is straight up or you can take your drumstick and slice the meat off of the bone i believe emily you have something i wonder if that's brad ford that's asking by chance but a fellow named brad is asking of any side dishes i would recommend Absolutely. So these are things that uh, are going to be in season. I'm a huge fan of seasonality. So things that are going to be in season during when you have your geese. Uh, Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts. I mean, people have, may have had a dish like Brussels sprouts and pancetta, right? But picture Brussels sprouts in goose fat. And the goose fat that's got that Chinese five spice. It's got all those other herbs. Got that lemon zest for that pop in there. It's amazing. Now also you reach inside of this cavity, you can absolutely use there we go here's a right now, actually hang on give me one second here inside of this cavity there'll be a lemon i can totally use this to finish your sauce with so really delicious and when you cook lemon it almost brings off a little bit of this perfume like essential oil from the 
the rind. It's really in there. It's, excuse me. It's written in a doctor. Yeah, but use this. It's almost like if anyone out there has ever used preserved lemons, you get the same sort of quality. Actually, it has a bit of a smell like um, like uh, fruit loops. So it's, it's a strange thing. But yeah, Brussels sprouts, uh, kale, uh, I mean, potatoes for sure. But you got to also take into account this is pretty much straight up all dark meat. So you want things that are going to be a little bit lighter to help, you know, accent that. If you're going to do a sauce too, you want it to be a kind of acidic. Finish it with apple cider vinegar or lemon juice or something like that to help brighten it up because it's a rich, rich dish. So I believe that concludes everything else. If anybody has questions, I'll hang out uh, for a couple more minutes uh, or rather a couple more seconds and, uh, you know, answer them as they may come. But uh, yeah, it's an absolute, you know, it's a shame this has fallen out of, out of uh, favor. I know a lot of folks will have turkey again on Christmas, and I can't even imagine what that'd be like. But I would highly recommend maybe either duck or maybe, you know, goose. And of course, the old school ham, why they used to serve ham on Christmas was because people would have it hanging in the root cellars. Uh, and it would kind of be at that point where you need to use it. So it's kind of like that idea that whatever needed to be used up at that time would be used up. Yes, Emily. Kelly is wondering. Yes, okay. So that was Brad Ford. As, so Brad Ford is, uh, oh, I, he's, what did he say? I miss you too, Brad. I'm ashamed that we didn't, uh, I'm, 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 I'm bummed that we weren't able to work together this year, but I cannot wait till this is all over so we can work together again. So Kelly. What other services we offer for catered events? So we do uh, we do a lot of weddings. We do special events. We do every once in a while some ticketed events uh, where we're really giving us the opportunity to just go wild. Uh, at the end of the day, yes, I'm a chef by trade, but really I'm an artist by my heart. I mean, I grew up falling asleep with uh, sketching pencils in my hand. My mother showed me all these pictures. So I, I believe in giving folks an entire experience that engages all of their senses, through visuals, through smells, obviously through the food. But uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll travel just about anywhere. Uh, we've done, we've gone to Canada, to Tennessee, to Maryland. Um, and when we do that, we actually specialize in using the food in the area. So whatever our style of food is for that specific menu, it uh, is representative of the flavor of the region. So again, if you have any questions on, you know, inquiries about working with us, events at heirloomfire.com. You can follow us on Instagram at heirloomfire. My personal Instagram is at Chef James Gop. Uh, the website is heirloomfire.com. Uh, it's got some great pictures on there, a little more of our philosophy. So anyhow, if you guys have any questions after this, please let me know. Please sign up for the mailing list. And again, a really big thank you to Field and Supply. We've worked with them several times over the years. I absolutely love it. Uh, I think the marriage of what we do in celebrating the connection of makers and just reintegrating that piece into our lives as human beings, people that are true artisans and forget about the things that are made on huge you know, production scales, the artisans, the imperfections, the one-of-a-kind pieces. It's a beautiful thing. So thank you all. <clears throat> Excuse me, the chicken, or rather the, the, the goose skin is still uh, giving me pleasure. Thank you all for tuning in. I truly hope that you give this a shot and sign up for the mailing list so I can get you the recipe. Everyone have a great night. And uh, from my fire to yours, happy holidays. Be well, be safe. Thank you all. <laughs>